Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Localization Fireside Chat uh, channel. Uh, we're coming to you from uh, on YouTube and on uh, Spotify and all the podcast uh, favorite channels of yours. Feel free to look us up and uh, check us out. The Localization Fireside channel is a dedicated channel for the localization industry or for anybody who's interested in languages in general. Today, my uh, on this episode, and my guest, and I'm honored to have her with me, Lola Bendana, uh, another Canadian language uh, uh, household name and an industry leader in the uh, in the country on the language on the language industry side. Glad to have you with me, uh, Lola, and uh, thanks for participating with the conversation today. Always uh, good to have your perspective on the localization industry as well. I know you have a uh, quite the experience and the history in the uh, in the translation and localization industry. And I can't wait to have our conversation together. As we always say on this channel, everybody's got a story as to how and how did you start and how did you become part of the localization industry? What drove you to this and the passion that drives you to continue driving the localization industry forward? So without further ado, I will give the, um, uh, the uh, mic to Lola to introduce herself, tell us a little bit about herself and about uh, the company that she owns and manages here in Canada. Go ahead, Lola. Thank you so much, Robin, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to have a conversation with you and all of that you have done and we share, you know, some of the activities together. Uh, so I started many, many years ago, around 36 years ago, when I was in university. I was a student and one of the majors that I was taking was English translation. As part of the work before I graduated university, we needed to do an internship. And my internship ended up being interpreting and translating for Nicaraguan refugees in the Costa Rican side of the border. I was studying in Costa Rica. And this was where I fell in love. I fell in love with languages and with breaking the language barrier. I saw this is something that is so needed to transform people's lives. And I was just a student, right? I didn't have, besides the training from university, zero experience. And I noticed uh, one of the, and people ask, how come like the two countries are Spanish speakers? There are situations like that was in that time where the UN representatives that were in Costa Rica to support Nicaraguan refugees in Costa Rica were English speaking only. Mm -hmm. And the people who were in Costa Rica coming as refugees really needed that support. So that was my first contact with the profession. Soon after I immigrated to Canada and when deciding you know, where do I want to go? What do I want to work? And I felt that's my call. That's my passion. I really want to work in language services. That was what I was also part of my studies in university. And that's how I started. I started as a freelancer translating English into Spanish. So that was the, the first step to say. That's the beginning. <laughs> that's the beginning. There is always a beginning, right? Absolutely. And um, I know, um, when did you immigrate to Canada? What year? Because I immigrated to Canada in the 90s, I think. 88. Oh, 88. So you came a little bit before me. I immigrated in 1990. And it's very fascinating about this country. It's made up, you know, like um, most of it is made up of immigrants who contributed to uh, the Canadian, uh, the Canadian economy, the Canadian uh, culture, uh, the country itself. And look, I mean, uh, languages, what a what a fascinating story. It's in terms of enabling the human connection between cultures, demographics, um, and enabling that uh, human understanding. I mean, as you know, I mean, every culture has its own um, way of speaking, um, the traditions, cultures, etc. And language conversion between languages allows for that exchange, which makes us a lot richer as a country. So tell me, like, from the moment you started, um, you must have had some events that changed things for you on your side. You decided to say, okay, I'm going to expand. I'm going to put a company together. I see an opportunity here. I see a business opportunity. Here. And the reason I asked the question is because, as you know, I see a lot of, um, you know, you see a lot of uh, today, in our today's world, you see a lot of financial uh, attraction to the industry, like um, private equities uh, and, and, uh, and companies and investors who has money to invest, and they're drifting toward the uh, localization industry. They see an opportunity in localization industry. But initially, what opportunity did you foresee that triggered it that says, you know what, I'm going to start my own company. I don't want to work for anybody else. I just want to start my own company. What, what, what triggers you? What triggered was what is still <clears throat> fascinating for me, which is Canada's diversity. 
again, my experiences back home were more related to one, two, three languages that I saw around. When I came to Toronto, we are speaking about 100 different languages, 200 different languages. And I had clients Mm -hmm. who were asking me for my translations English to Spanish, and they needed 10 different languages. So that kind of click and say, there are opportunities in here. This diversity is so unique that we have in Canada that it, it is it is something that I definitely want to tap on. Also, learning about other cultures has always been fascinating for me. Learning on, you know, about you know the different different people and different languages. So I started, mm-hmm. I work as a freelancer around eight years or so. And then I incorporated the business in 1997, 26 years ago. And mm-hmm. that I was already providing services in a couple of languages. So that I decided to expand and I'm going to go into multiple languages. Right now we have on the database, I believe 178, last time I checked, different languages. We don't work with all of them all the time, but they are available if we need to. And, and this is something that it's an, an incredible gift that we have in Canada, that we have access to this you know, rich culture and rich diversity uh, from people from all over the world with very high qualifications. And, and for the audience that doesn't know you, I know you well, but for the audience that don't know you, what's the name of your company and how can they find out more about your company? Yes, the company is Multi Languages Corporation and the website is multi-languages.com. We have plenty of information there and a link to an, an email that people can access to. Switching gears a little bit, I know uh, you have a family and you live nearby uh, the Toronto area. The biggest question I have is, is the family involved in the business? Is this like sort of a, a family business or just your business and you take care of it? Yes, I started the business and right now my older son works with me full time. He is VP of innovation. Also, my husband is the one who developed the database for me to work on. He's a software developer. He's not fully involved in the business, but he supports the the tech piece. So it's always been a a family business. And when the other kids were little, they always were helping in one way or the other. So absolutely, I would say it's a, a family business. Excellent. And you know what? We always talk in in the uh, in every business. Um, it doesn't matter if it's in the localization or any other industry. You need that second generation to be trained. To be, I was talking to Vlad Fox. He was featured on uh, on this channel early on, and I asked him the same question. He's also an immigrant, which is uh, came into the country around the same time you and I came to the country, and maybe a year before or something. And he was telling me the story about his son now runs the company. He took over, etc. So it, it's very um, positive to see this. And why? Because you don't want to see what you've built as an entrepreneur. You worked hard for for so many years to build, to put the building blocks together, to wither and 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 go away uh, in some fashion. You want it to continue. You wanted to hand it over to the next generation. And you and I worked together on the uh, on the Canadian Languages Association. And one of the uh, one of the things that we always talk about is industry sustainability. And the industry sustainability is part of that. Meaning that who is going to take over this industry? After this generation retires, and you know, um, and or this generation decide to do something completely different, not necessarily retire, which is a big deal. I mean, as you know, uh, it's an aging population, it's an aging um, languages. It's not different than any other industry. You know, we deal with that. People retire, people move on, and but one of the things is in the language industry because it's harder to build. You know, people think it's easy, and and I know you can attest to that. People, it's easy, you know, you, you think you want to build any business. I don't know. You want to open a convenience store. You want to buy a supermarket. You want to buy, you know, a manufacturing environment. You just go buy the manufacturing environment. You adapt the process a little bit and off you go. In the translation business, there is no, as you can agree, there is no standard process for each customer. You try as much as you can, but every customer has got a different requirements. Every tax is different, et cetera. So it's harder to build a unified business, a unique business around the many uh, demands and requirements per customer, per request, et cetera. So when you took the time to build and to, you know, put a company together and to last as long as, you, because business is full of risk, when a company lasts 26, 27 years, this is an a testament to how successful that you build the, you build the business together. Because, you know, risk could take a business away at any time. Uh, yeah. But if you manage it um, accordingly, or you manage it in a, in a, in a, in a way that, Preventing. I mean, we've all been through the crisis, right? 2008, et cetera. So we've all seen it. 
Tell me a little bit about what I just said here. How's that uh, resonating in your case? Uh, uh, absolutely, and you're totally right. And we are working on that, right? And seeing how the older generation, which is a big, big part of our industry, is retiring, and we need to look at that sustainability in regards to you know the the uniqueness of our sector. Absolutely, and this is one of the reasons, probably, when back then I started to get involved in different organizations because I started, I incorporated started the business and I wanted to expand. And as I wanted to expand, I wanted to work in other languages. It was different for me working on Spanish. I can step, attest to the quality, right? But what if I'm working in Tamil or Chinese or Italian? I thought, what is out there that I can use as a platform? And there was nothing. There were no standards. There was, and, and that's why I, I started getting involved. Like, you know, know, like the different associations that we have worked with, you know, in creating those standards mm -hmm. and figure it out what is out there, like what kind of training, what are the, you know, systems in place to guarantee quality, to see what are the processes, who are the translators and the interpreters or professionals that need to work in our sector to establish all of those. So definitely that was my first curiosity. How do I set up this business in a way that I can guarantee the quality to my clients? Because that always came to mind first, right? I want to take care of my clients and I want to make sure that they have the sure. quality that they are expecting from me. So it, it, it has been a very interesting journey. And absolutely, if you have been in business, you know, 20, 20 something years, you know, the ups and downs. Absolutely. Uh, we, we have gone through it all. Right? No, I mean, uh, one of the things we always talk about in the uh, in the language in industry is that up and down. And you mentioned you hit a uh, and, and how does weather the, you know, even on a micro level, like even on a customer level or a project level, you know, volume goes up, volume goes down, but you have to be able to adapt to the highs and lows and similar to on the macro side as an as a company you have to adapt to you know many customers less customers many employees less employees and have those just in time processes to adapt to all this to all this sorry moving environment and um on the uh, on the um on the uh, uh ability to work not just in the company that you work with, and you and I talked a little bit before the call a little bit on us on this one, you know, to be able to be passionate enough to work on on the on the on the company, you have to be curious. And part and you mentioned the word curious earlier, which is which is really cool because curiosity drives innovation, it drives discovery, it drives better ways of doing things. And um part of that curiosity, at least on my side, is to be involved with other things outside of the job that I'm doing to allow me to expand my mind a little bit. Um, and a lot in some cases <laughs> depends on what I'm involved in. So um, I know you're involved in many other aspects other than managing your own company. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Oh, I've been, yeah, absolutely. I've been involved in many different nonprofit organizations in the board of directors. Probably the first two years I was a little bit lost when I, I was starting the business trying to figure it out, like, how do I do this, right? That was one of my questions. And when I couldn't find the answers, I was looking for those solutions. So one of the first organizations that I joined the board was the Healthcare Interpretation Network, which later on evolved to be in the OCCI, which I'm still mem a member of the board of the Ontario Council on Community Interpreting, the same for translation, right? So I started being members of the board. And when working with this association, looking at what kind of projects can help not only my business, but can help the industry in general. Because one of the things that I think business owners, if we want to keep that passion and that moving forward, we need to contribute. It's not just how can I you know, improve my business, but I feel the need to also improve the sector, to help others that are coming, to help the students that are graduating in translation mm -hmm. and interpreting. So one of the big examples for me, because it has been a, a breakthrough uh, in my business life, it's the creation of standards. This is something that for some people, the standards could be boring for me are fascinating mm -hmm. and creating. I was the lead who created the national standards for interpreting services for community interpreting back in 2007. And that was kind of the first stepping stone. At that time, the ISO interpreting standard didn't even exist. ISO based the first standard on the Canadian one. So that was incredible. And as I was working on creating those standards together with a group, of course, we set up a stakeholder group to have multi-representation from different, different people and different sectors. As I was setting up those, I was at the same time improving my, my systems in my business, which were missing some pieces. 
And mm -hmm. then when I was doing all that research and seeing, okay, I'm going to read all the different standards around the world, code of ethics, and, and think how these things happen, I'm going to improve my services. Same happened with translation. When we created the very first CGSB in 2008, there were so many things, many of us were just starting to discover and mm -hmm. starting to apply to our own business. It says, well, I'm missing this piece here. I'm changing this requirement. Maybe these translators I'm working on are not the best option for my mm -hmm. clients. I'm going to change that. I'm going to change the process, the requirements. And it has been a journey of discovery. And, and every time that we revise it right now, as you know, we are yeah. in another stage of revising the CGSB. This is the third time that we are revising. Right. And it's a huge learning experience. I am a learner. I need yeah. to constantly be learning and also constantly be associating or being mm -hmm. very, you know, stick to the mission, right? You know, okay. if you want to keep that mission of providing the quality service, I feel that I need to be active and I need to be learning. So it really has been, you know, a journey. Other associations, for example, I was the president of IMIA. I was on that board for six years, which is the International Medical Interpreters Association. And it was a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. I got to meet, which is, this is another big thing, meeting the colleagues such as you and other colleagues in the sector who mm -hmm. are incredible human beings. It, it has been a gift. Absolutely. Work with so many colleagues in the, these different organizations it's something that really lifts you up it keeps me going it keeps you know that you know emotional fire really you know looking forward to work on this project or that project and also keeps the business moving forward right like so that, that's something that has really helped and, and, and you know you bring a very good point is that uh, connectivity i mean i you know there's a lot of initiatives being launched uh, well they are they launched already globally in terms of localization like low lunch uh um, you know, the, the various conferences, the various associations, global associations. You know, the industry is not that big of an industry globally. It's uh, close to $60 billion, which is in, in the general grand scheme of things, it's a tiny industry when it compares to other industries. Um, there are 18, 19,000 uh, transition companies around the world or localization companies around the world. But then you need that connectivity. You need to create association. You need to bring those people together with common thoughts, common worries, common challenges to solve, common problems to sit down and discuss and, 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 and try to figure it out. And what I like about our industry, what I like about the localization industry is that everybody is willing to lend a hand. Everybody is willing to give you their opinion. Uh, and, you know, sometimes the opinion probably doesn't work for your situation, but at least they're not hiding anything. They're not, you know, telling you what the, you, you need to hear. They're telling you, this is how I dealt with this specific situation. And I, you know, if maybe it works for you, maybe it doesn't work for you, but at least you gain knowledge with those conversations. And I also found that, you know, even though our businesses and our jobs keeps us running like, you know, almost uh, 24 by seven, you sometimes somehow you still find a way, and I you're, you're the champion of that, um, find a way to find time for associations, for being involved, for giving back. And I don't know, like, how do we do that? How do you do that sometimes? <laughs> Running a business, have a family, have an association, multiple associations. Where do you find the time? How do you do time management? Well, time allocation. I have a time budget for different things, right? And I believe that is prioritization. When we prioritize and know that this is important enough, like creating those connections, it's important enough for the business and for myself as well mm -hmm. as getting, you know, contacting a potential client and trying to sell uh, to a potential lead. So it's about prioritization and knowing how important this is for the growth of the business and the growth of the industry. As I mentioned, for me, one big, big point is contribution. If I am helping, I am, you know, happy, right? And one of the things that we do in the business is have events. For example, the last two events have been panels of around 10 different professional, international professionals, uh, presidents and vice presidents of professional associations, creating that connection, creating that content, discussing, for example, the code of ethics from around the world and the perspective from these experts it really brings a lot of value to me, to the business, and to my audience, to my translators, my interpreters, my clients. So it's all about adding value. And that's when I see that prioritization, I absolutely find the time to it. Also, there are multiple ways. One of the things that we also do is we do consulting uh, besides the language services. And in this consulting, one of the areas is time management and time mastery that I work with, because that's something that, you know, I have worked very well with it. And there are 
some of my clients definitely can use some some of that help. So knowing how to focus, how to avoid the distractions is so important. Like distractions really drain our time oh, that, sure. or the productive time that we want to have, right? Mm-hmm. So eliminating those distractions is, is a big piece. Knowing how to focus and not only how to focus, but how to refocus, like how to go back to what we're, we're, we're doing and allocating certain time. And one last point in terms of time is what I call the optimization of time. And we, when we optimize the time is that you, even though we are not multitaskers, because our brain doesn't work as multitasking, it's just switching between one activity and the other. However, we can optimize the time when there are two activities that you can do simultaneously. And for example, when if I need to listen to a podcast on localization, I may be cooking at the time that I'm listening to the podcast. So you're doing two things at the same time, even though you're using different parts of the brain to do that. So optimizing the time is really a valuable skill that we could develop. It's very good advice, by the way. You know, I want to give this advice that you'd share this advice and emphasize it. The one you just gave us, uh, Lola, for the listeners of this podcast. There's no reason why you can't listen to this podcast. You have to listen to podcasts, even if you're cooking. Put your ear pods on and, and listen to the podcast. <clears throat> Absolutely. Now, tell me, now, I know uh, there are a few things here in the Canadian economy and global economy is the same way, I guess. We're all in the same, uh, we're living in the same conditions. You know, with inflation, interest rate, um, you know, what worries you and how are you doing in all of this? Well, one one of the first things is, Make sure that you know your numbers, right? There are times that business owners, and this is one of the reasons why many businesses go out of business because they didn't keep track of their numbers. So first and foremost, the very basics, and it will sound very basic, but it's extremely important, is know your numbers, know where you are right now, know where you want to go in terms of number, and also keep an eye on how the industry is moving. Uh, The other big, big portion is the mindset. Being optimistic because I don't watch the news to start with. There, I may read and filter some of it, but I don't proactively watch news. And one of the reasons is because then you are getting a lot of the negativity into you yourself, and that sometimes it may stop you from moving forward. So being really optimistic and knowing, okay, like I'm getting ten more clients this month. I'm going to go after those 10 more clients. Or I'm going to maybe go to past clients that have not ordered in the last two or three years, and Mm -hmm. I'm going to reach out to them. So definitely, we have to take in consideration what's going on in the economy. There is inflation. We have to be aware of it. And we have to be aware also of the rising cost. This this is something very important uh, in regards to our contractors, for example. Uh, However, the, the most important thing is that we don't have, we don't get consumed by the fear of, whatever is going on in the economy, because as in any other time period, as we know, anything that goes up goes down and it will get better. So there, there are times that are challenging times, but these challenging times will will pass. And that's something very important to keep in mind. This will pass. And what am I doing? Like, am I taking advantage of the opportunity that comes with these challenging mm-hmm. times? Because there are opportunities out there. Just to give you an example, Robin, there is... Uh, in the past, we used to provide translation and interpreting services. Right now, we have an expansion of multiple services. A lot of them are in the language sector uh, mm-hmm. area, but there are also other services that we are offering within our consulting department. Uh, for example, facilitation, facilitation of workshops. So look at what is that the client needs right now and take advantage of those opportunities. So that's one way that we can, you know, Basically, be flexible, yeah. basically. Be flexible and try to come up with other services that you can a customer may require that you normally wouldn't have thought about offering. Is that what yeah, you're saying? During the recession. And, and one of the yeah. examples that many, many years ago, when I started doing consulting, I had a hospital who was one of my clients. I have many hospitals who are clients. And uh, they were having a challenge with the booking of assignments, sending repeated do- do- double documentation for translations and double booking interpreters and all of that. By having a conversation with the manager, what we found is that they really needed some support with admin portion, with administration, with uh, organization of records of data, time mastery. And then we start doing launch and learns with the whole staff team that work on that department. And we had... 50, 60 people meeting uh, every other week or so. And those problems were corrected. So the problem was not in the language department. It was because of other root 
uh, problems that were going on. So identifying in a recession, during an inflation, what are the new needs of a client? Are they saving money on one thing because of what, right? So finding out what exactly is what they need and mm -hmm. working on that, do you need to expand your services? And what will be those services? What is your expertise in order to provide those services? So I, I think that that really have helped me in the past as well when they have been challenging times is mm -hmm. always looking at the opportunities. What is the opportunity out there right now to support my client at a higher level and be able to keep the business you know, growing and moving forward? I mean, we started the conversation talking about innovation and um, innovation comes in a variety of ways, not just on the tech side, which is also important, but also on the uh, creativity uh, side when it comes to how do you serve your customers and what do you offer to your customers? The needs out there, and, and, and because we're in a service environment, uh, the needs out there are changing every day. And with the introduction of a variety of uh, solutions, um, it, it, it dri driver fa driving factors, like uh, cost pressure, um, you know, economic pressures, technology is changing uh, quite a bit. Dynamic technology changing. The environment in the technology is like becoming so dynamic. You know, you know what you know today is different from what we know tomorrow. Uh, a lot of things are changing, and um, the individuals and I know it's just some fundamental things in business. If you stay static, you don't move, you don't change. That means you're on your way out. And if you adapt. Uh, you learn, as you mentioned earlier, be curious, you know, offer more services, add technology, uh, not necessarily because you want to add technology. If the customer doesn't need technology, why would you add it? Add it to support your customer base, add it to support your, uh, your business. Um, and those are driving factors. And the biggest thing for in any business, I'm sure you agree with that, is cash flow. And, you know, watch out for, I mean, I mentioned, you mentioned earlier, know your numbers, which is very, very important. You know, the killer in any business is cash flow. You run out of cash flow. Here you go. It goes the business. So um, having said all this, um, and I know a lot of our listeners are in, in our audience here on the podcast, not necessarily large company, they may be small, smaller companies, uh, maybe companies with three, four employees, 10 employees, 20 employees, et cetera, mid-size to, uh, to, a, to a smaller kind of company. Uh, what do you, what do you, what's your recommendation for them? I mean, they don't necessarily be Canadian. Let's say they are Canadian or they're not. What's oh. your recommendation these days? I think you mentioned already, stay flexible and innovate. And uh, one of my events I mentioned to my group is innovate or die, as simple as that. Because you really, really have to be flexible and identify what is what the client is willing to pay. Sometimes okay. we are very attached. This is the way I translate and this is what I want to sell. And that's okay. not the case anymore, right? Like this, especially these times. The changes are happening so fast that you cannot even create a business plan for five years because it's going to be obsolete in six months, right? Yeah. So be flexible to the changes, be informed and connect with people. The connection that I mentioned earlier is so essential. You cannot work isolated in the language sector. You have to be a member of organizations. You have to be listening to this type of podcast, connecting with people on LinkedIn, any anywhere and going in person to events. This is something right. that to start remembering that it's yeah i know you're, you're absolutely correct a lot of people still hiding you know uh i, I know i don't do you know face-to-face -face meetings some people are refusing to meet still face-to-face -face, but it's you bring up a very good point the absolute great element in any human interaction is the face-to-face -face interaction and um, eliminate the fear and the convenience part right sometimes we have act out of fear or oh, a recession is coming i'm going to be you know in fear and therefore i'm not going to really take the action that i need to take to make my, my business succeed so fear yeah. is a big, big thing that we really want to you know to put aside as much as we can and the other one is the convenience yes of course it's more convenient to be at home and have the you know women are on the side while i do three other things right but that is not where the real value comes, when the real connection comes. Like you really want to see people in person. And this is, uh, we have our, our, you know, CLIA event coming up next month. I'm mm -hmm. really looking forward to see, you know, you and all the other people who are coming to the event. Yeah. It is makes a difference when you just turn off a camera and do something else. Sure. The presence is be present, be present with whatever you're doing. You are with your business, be present with that mm -hmm. business, with your colleagues, with, with your clients and, you know, just be there for them. And they will, they will notice that they will notice if you are, 
you know, fully present. And sometimes people say, oh, like uh, the prices are going down and I need to offer the lower price. In the 26 years we have been in business incorporated, I have never been the lowest bidder ever. And I have won multiple, multiple projects, as, as yeah. you can imagine, right? Mm -hmm. Both in RFPs and client direct clients and whatnot. So you don't need to be the lowest bidder. You want, you need to be the one adding the most value. That correct. Way. Correct. It's about value. It's not about price. You're exactly. absolutely, absolutely correct. And on the uh, uh, on the CLIA conference, I want to mention this and put a plug for our association on this podcast. The Canadian Language Industry Association will be hosting its annual conference. It's happening in Montreal on the 24th and the 25th. We hope all of our audience uh, who have not yet registered to register, go to the uh, Canadian Language Industry Association website and uh, there is an event page. You can register online. Uh, we'd look, we look forward to seeing you all in Montreal. It's happening at the McGill University. It'll be a good time. This year is our 20th anniversary, which we are very excited about uh, the festivity that's gonna take place. We have a very exciting schedule. There's a gala dinner on the 24th which will be very interesting as well. Very exciting for everybody. So whoever have not yet registered, please go ahead and register and look forward to seeing you in Montreal. And um, on that note, uh, we're coming up on the hour. Um, any last words on your side, uh, Lola? I want to thank you first. And uh, I'll, any last words on your side? Uh, you want to, any final thoughts, comments? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And then to all the your audience here, just have faith in our industry. We have a very bright future ahead of us and a lot of tools that we could use to make this even better. So we have a lot of opportunities coming up for us. And let's take advantage of it and let's keep the connection going. Absolutely. Thank you, Lola. And I appreciate it. I want to thank Lola Bernana for joining me today on Localization Fireside Chat. Uh, we look forward to having her back and uh, checking with her in a few months uh, on a specific topic this time. This time, this conversation has been more of a, a general introduction uh, for Lola and her company, Multilanguages. And we look forward to having her back and we'll check with her in a few months on what the topic of the hour at that time will be. In the meantime, uh, please subscribe if you haven't done that. So if you haven't done so yet on our YouTube channel and all of our podcast channel. And if you have any comments, uh, please let us know in the comment section. Thank you very much for joining. I really appreciate it and have a good day.